move on. Um, now we're going to hear from uh, Chuck Murray. He's a professor at the University of Washington, a director for the Center of Cardiovascular Biology and a William and Mary Connor chair for the Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine. And today he's going to talk about a very timely topic. He's going to talk about using uh, human iPS uh, cell derived uh, cardiomyocytes for COVID-19 disease modeling. Uh, take it away, Chuck. So shall I just uh, launch? I'll take that to mean yes. So uh, hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm pleased to tell you this morning about some work that we've been doing on using human stem cell derived cardiomyocytes for modeling uh, COVID-19 heart disease. Uh, I just want to disclose that uh, I recently made a move into a biotech company, and so I'm spending four days a week working for a company called Sana Biotechnology. This whole talk that I'll give you today is uh, a University of Washington talk. I want to start by with perhaps the most important slide, which is to acknowledge the members of my group uh, that really made this happen, in particular a, a postdoc named Silvia Marchiano. Silvia is Italian, and while this, uh, this this started back in March when the when the pandemic burst out, we decided to make a pivot, and Silvia went to the highest concentration of live COVID-19 virus in the Pacific Northwest, which is behind a barrier facility run by our uh, colleague from uh, immunology, Michael Gale, who's a virologist and an immunologist. Uh, Tim Martins has also moved our high throughput screening facility into the barrier facility, and we're looking for anti-COVID drugs, but that, that'll be a story for another day. Sylvia did the cardiac disease modeling. Uh, this is a, a, a slide to introduce the topic of COVID-19 and the heart. This is from a recent review by uh, from Joe Wu's group. Everybody knows, of course, that COVID-19 is, is primarily a respiratory infection. So cartoon-wise, this virion infects cells in the distal airways, particularly type 2 pneumocytes, and it works through this ACE2 receptor as its principal mode of entry into the cell. And while this battle is raging in the lungs, uh, physicians began to notice that people were getting better from their lung disease, but were going on to die from cardiac complications like heart failure, acute myocardial infarction, and arrhythmias. And the, we, you know, many of us in the community are wondering what's going on? What is this COVID-19 related heart disease? It's complicated, of course, because systemic inflammation creates the cytokine storm situation, and that can be very deleterious to the heart, the, uh, the you know, interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, inter interferons, things like that are, are very bad for cardiomyocytes. Uh, there could be vascular effects like uh, vascular thrombosis. This is well described. This could cause uh, acute coronary syndromes and so forth, myocardial infarctions. But we wanted to, to test a third possibility. Could it be that cardiomyocytes are becoming directly infected? And this is a really a direct rather than an indirect pathway to cell injury. So the, this is a slide from a, a patient who uh, succumbed to COVID-19 heart cardiac disease at the University of Washington. And this is uh, what you can see is a, along this intramyocardial blood vessel, there's a mononuclear inflammatory cell infiltrate and zones of cardiomyocyte damage. And so this kind of looks like myocarditis and we are wondering whether in fact this my, uh, a myocarditis-like syndrome might be driven by direct COVID-19 infection. So we went on to look at cardiomyocytes derived from stem cells and ask whether they had the correct machinery to support viral entry and then viral uh, replication. So what you're looking at here in the, in the uh, upper left corner is a Western blot and we're looking at human prepotent stem cells and they do not express the ACE receptor at, at protein at any significant levels. Vero cells are a primate uh, kidney epithelial cell line that's commonly used to propagate the virus. And so this is, considered to be reasonably abundant levels of H2. Then here are three different uh, human cardiomyocytes developed from uh, two lines of embryonic stem cells, H7 and RUS2, both of these are female. And then the WTC11 is a male IPS line. And all of them have reasonable amounts of ACE2. And of course, ACE2 is involved in blood pressure regulation and things like that. So the, it would make sense that the cardiomyocytes would have this protein. We went on to do single cell RNA sequencing and on these UMAP plots, it's, it's the same set of uh, single cell data displayed just with various uh, uh, genes of interest that, that we're gonna be looking at. The first one is a cardiomyocyte marker, troponin T, and you can see all of this, it's, it's a highly pure prep compared to the 90% cardiomyocytes. Uh, we looked for the, for the receptor ACE2 and these little black dots are the ones that are uh, above the threshold for ACE2 expression. So you can definitely see them, but they're a minority of the cells, which is kind of interesting. 
Uh, in terms of intracellular processing, we looked at some of the proteases that are involved, uh, cathepsins B and cathepsins L, and these are quite abundantly expressed. There is a surface receptor called Tempris 2 that is, I think of as sort of being involved in polishing the spike protein. It, it cleaves off a few uh, amino acids that seem to facilitate entry. Uh, interestingly, that we do not see in our cardiomyocytes at all. And then there's this endosomal lipid kinase called PIK5 uh, that's also involved in intracellular processing. And this is quite abundantly expressed. So most of the elements are there, not quite all, but it seemed plausible that the cardiomyocyte might be able to support a SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we went ahead and, and took two different uh, lines, the H7 embryonic stem cell line that's female and the WTC11 line uh, that's IPS and male, derived cardiomyocytes from them and exposed them to different multiplicities of infection of live uh, coronavirus. And so we, you can see initially these cells are happy, cardiomyocytes, they're beating and so forth. And by between 48 and 72 hours after infection, we see a clear cytopathic effect. The cells are balling up uh, and detaching and the dish is full of floaters and you can just see the bare tissue culture plastic uh, through this. And so this is, this is classic viral cytopathic effect. And of course, along the way, the beating stops uh, on route to death. So that was fairly impressive to us. So we, we dug into this deeper, you know, like what, what's going on how's this working exactly? So what you're looking at here is uh, immunostaining for uh, alpha actinin, which is a, a, a myofilament protein localized to the Z discs, and then the SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid antigen as, uh, as well. So uh, again, two different lines of cardiomyocytes. What you, what the first thing I notice, at least, because I look at cardiomyocytes all the time, is it's really hard to see myofibrils with sarcomeres in the upper panel. If I look down in the lower panel, some of these guys in the middle seem to have reasonable looking myofibrils, but these guys over here, it's all disheveled and, and diffuse staining. And interestingly, this corresponds to the, the intact contractile cytoskeleton is a region that is not yet infected. It's negative for the nucleocapsid antigen. Uh, but these other cells, you can just see they're chock full of nucleocapsid antigen. And that's, and that's easily seen in this overlay. So looks like there is a lot of viral antigen that is present in, inside of these poor cardiomyocytes. Uh, we then went on to do plaque forming assays to, to actually see whether there was new live virus that's being produced. And so this is just a, a shot of one of our uh, plaque assays on each one of these little uh, uh, translucent zones is a lytic event that indicates a single virion infected a cardiomyocyte. So first we're going to look at intracellular viral RNA and this is reference to a housekeeping gene HPRT and we get like 10 to the fifth fold uh, overexpression compared of, of the viral genome compared to HPRT. Uh, this crashes as the cells die of course and then if we look at live virus production the supernatant this shoots up to quite high levels uh, and then crashes as well. That's a, and, and let me just back up. This is a, this is a single step growth curve when we hit them at a relatively high multiplicity of infection, uh, five viruses per cardiomyocyte, so presumably synchronous infection and just watch it play out in time. And then we also do multi-step growth curves where we do an inoculum of 0.1 MOI and we watch the, the, the pandemic in a plate basically sweep through the cultures. And you can see that you can get, you know, even higher levels of viral RNA and live virus produced by this as well. And one of the things that Mike Gale, our virologist, told me was, you know, this is, I, these to him were eye popping levels of virus, much higher levels than we see produced from standard lung epithelial lines that, that virologists used to study this thing. So th this is really, to me, quite interesting. Uh, we wanted to see how this affected the physiology of the heart, thinking again to the patients who have arrhythmias. We put our cells into multi electrode arrays. And so this is a, a phase image of what, what it looks like in, in, in three different conditions. We put these cardiomyocytes in quite densely so that we can get a good electrical signal. And the first thing you see is that the amplitude of the spike goes down. Uh, this is, I think, 48 hours after infection uh, in, a, in a dose dependent manner. So that it looks like the cells are sick, but these guys are not yet dead and detached. So these are sick cells, but not just wiped out. It's not a wiped out empty plate. And what we can see looking at some standard electrical parameters of the of cardiomyocyte behavior, the, the, the frequency of contraction goes down in a dose dependent and a time dependent manner. The amplitude of the spike, uh, which is just really how much voltage is, is being uh, induced by depolarization, 
Uh, this goes down in a dose in a time dependent manner and the conduction velocity, the way that an impulse sweeps across the plate goes down in a dose in a time dependent manner. So clearly electrical run down. Um, the next thing we wanted to do was to look at contractile force. Uh, Dr. Blau showed you a beautiful system of tra tra uh, traction force microscopy to look at single cell. This is a multicellular tissue engineered prep where we've taken uh, cardiomyocytes, mixed them with stromal cells at a nine to one ratio, and then cast them into a fibrin gel. Uh, one, one post is rigid, it's got a capillary tube in it, the other one is, is flexible, and we put a little magnet in the tip of it so that we can measure the deflection, and knowing the stiffness of the, the post, we can calculate the amount of force that it produces. So it's like a little cardio gym. I think this is kind of fun. So let me just show you a picture of what this looks like. On the left is the rigid post. On the right is the flexible post. And you can see our, this is a healthy uh, piece of engineered heart muscle uh, that, that's beating in a 24 well plate. So what we see, uh, if we look at twitch force that, that is produced, the, 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 the controls of course just go beating merrily. And the ones that we expose to virus uh, start to run down between 48 and 72 hours, and by 144 hours, there's essentially no contractile activity seen at all. Uh, the representative twitches are shown here. In the black, we see the baseline at 72 hours. Uh, the, the, the red line is starting to diminish, and again, it's really quite puny mechanical activity that remains by six days afterwards. Uh, the last thing I'll show you is a couple of uh, very, to me, very interesting electron microscopic pictures of the infection going on. Um, we we sand these uh, cells in such a way that it makes the membranes really pop because we thought you know, the membranes would give us a lot of insight into the viral pathogenesis. Using this technique, the myofibrils don't pop as much. So I'm going to ask you to squint and see these kind of filamentous things that are running along the bottom from left to right. And then this dark stuff here. Uh, so this is the, the long axis of a myofibril, and this dark stuff would be the Z disk. So, so with that, uh, what I'll call your attention to are these uh, tubular membrane structures that run along like this. This is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the, the ER of the cardiomyocyte. And this is quite abundant in this particular region. And what's really interesting is we get these dilated tubular membranous structures that have nascent viral particles in them. And so one of the one of the lessons that I learned that the, these coronaviridae don't acquire their membranes by budding off from the cell, but in fact they they sort of bud into the cell into these internal uh, cavities of the of these membranous systems, and, and so it's in the uh, ER Golgi system that they actually acquire their uh, acquire their membranes. And then it looks like this is fanciful, but the, the, they it, but it looks to me like these tubular systems dump into a space that I've called a cistern that's got this, uh, this electron dense region around it that I imagine to be like something like a, a, li a, a liquid liquid phase separation going on. And we see viral particles starting to collect in the cytoplasm. If we look at uh, things that are a little more mature, we start to see these membranous vesicles that are just chock full of mature uh, coronaviridae. Uh, and so these vesicles are, are what I think are going to be the, the way the virus actually gets out of the cell. And if we look around, we can find examples. So here we're just out of the tip of one cardiomyocyte. There's some myofibrils that, that I'll show you in, in a minute for context. But this is one of these vesicles that I think is, is fusing to the plasma membrane and is releasing these viruses into the extracellular space. And you can see the whole surface of this cardiomyocyte is just studded with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And taking a step back, this is, you can see myofibrils and so forth. Here's a very unhappy mitochondrion and all of these coronaviruses that are coming along. Here is the vesicle that I showed you that seems to be fusing. Here's one that perhaps got there a little bit earlier and, and has fewer viral contents remaining inside. So the whole, it, it's like what they teach you in, in, in microbiology class, the whole cell is really taken over and turned into a virus producing factory. And when we do our um, single cell RNA sequencing, half of the RNA transcripts that we get are virus, not cardiomyocyte transcripts. So let me just wind up with what I've, what I've shown you so far, or this is the end of the talk, but um, basically the, the human cardiomyocytes derived from stem cells express the ACE2 receptor and other critical cofactors needed for the viral life cycle. Uh, we get clear cytopathic effects when we expose the virus to, to the cardiomyocytes at various multiplicities of infection. 
uh, the, the virus can replicate exceedingly well in cardiomyocytes. This seems to be one of the most permissive cell types for viral replication. And before they die, they go through this series of electrical and mechanical um, dysfunction steps uh, en route to death. From an electron microscopic standpoint, I showed you how the, uh, some evidence of the way the virus assembles, and it, it, it's really focused around the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. It creates these vesicles, and it looks like these vesicles then exocytose into the outside world. And so my, my findings, uh, I mean, excuse me, my interpretation of these findings is that this is not proof, this is evidence. This is evidence that supports the hypothesis that we should be thinking about direct infection of patients. These aren't mature cardiomyocytes in a living patient suffering from, from the COVID-19, right? These are immature cardiomyocytes in a dish that we hit with the virus. Uh, that said, it, I think it's reasonable to, to pursue this course further. And it suggests to me that perhaps in our patients who get uh, COVID-19, we should be concerned about long-term cardiac complications as a result. Uh, with that, I'd like to say thanks to all the people. I gave the big shout out to Sylvia, who really did most of the heavy lifting on this. Uh, this, this is my team at the University of Washington, and the folks that I've circled here have actually moved uh, and gone over to, to Sana Biotechnology. Um, thanks to collaborators and so forth who made this possible. And if there's any time left, I'd be happy to take a few questions. Thanks very much. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, let's start out by one from Jose or Ordovas Montaigne. Uh, so once infected by a virus, Byron, is there anything a cardiomyocyte can t do to protect themselves? Yeah, so cells, every, every cell has a little immune system sort of built into it because this host parasite thing is, is a very ancient conversation. And so cells have these uh, pattern recognition receptors that can recognize things like viral nucleic acids and viral antigens and things like that. Uh, these lead, lead to, through a series of signal transduction events to an interferon response. And then interfer once interferons come up, a, a whole variety of antiviral proteins are produced that can stop a virus in its tracks, even absent uh, an exogenous immune system. What we're seeing in the cardiomyocyte is that, say, compared to lung epithelium, they turn on the interferon response really late. And this may be why it gets so far down the path um, prior to, uh, you know, why, why this, the cardiomyocyte seems to be such a good host. Great. Okay. So the next question by, by Shaheen Rafi. Uh, he asks, is it possible whether the, um, the small population uh, infected with COVID were in Endothelial cells in your culture? Whether, whether these might be endothelial cells? Is that, is that Shaheen's question? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, so, so there, there, are, there are no endothelial cells. These are 90 plus percent cardiomyocytes. And we're, so the, the, the short version is no. And in fact, endothelial cells are hard to infect. We, we've taken a bunch of different primary endothelial sources for commercial uh, approaches. We've taken fetal endothelial cells from a variety of organs, and we've taken stem cell derived endothelium. And maybe we get some viral entry, but there's no productive life cycles, and we don't see anything like this. Uh, and the same kind of thing in smooth muscle cells. So it, it seems like cardiomyocytes are much more susceptible than these other cardiovascular cell types. And I have a follow-up question whether, uh, have you looked at the single cell sequencing databases uh, from uh, heart organs? Uh, maybe uh, some adult data sets to whether there's uh, ACE2 expression in the cardiomyocytes or whether it's the same heterogeneity of ACE expression? So it, it looks like in the adult human heart, in the healthy adult human heart, uh, uh, ACE2 expression is lower in cardiomyocytes than what we see in the cardiomyocytes derived from stem cells. And so that's one of the reasons I think this is, you know, I, I tried to be careful and say this is a model system and it doesn't necessarily tell us what's going on in a mature adult. Uh, and so we're still we're still working on what's happening with the adult heart in COVID-19 patients. Okay, great. Thank you very much.